So on today's show, we have Richard Beadle, superstar male model, fashion designer and art director, and considered by many as one of the most influential names in menswear for our generation. Rich is one of the most prominent faces at men's fashion weeks across the world. He's walked and shot for the biggest brands around, including Armani, Ralph Lauren, Paul Smith, to name just a few. And what I've always found most fascinating about Rich is that he actually started his career as a solicitor before moving into the world of fashion. Rich breaks the mould in so many ways and is an incredibly passionate and principled individual and has become a good friend of mine over the last few years of knowing each other. So welcome, Rich. Thanks for having me, mate. How are you? I'm good. It's a big introduction. I hope I don't let you down. You won't. You won't. I'm sure of it. (laughs) We always have great chats, so I'm sure this will be far ranging and, and very interesting for our listeners. So, um, so yeah, one of the things that I mentioned in the intro there was that um, you started your career, your professional career as a solicitor, which is not the classic uh, move from solicitor into, uh, into the fashion industry. So I'm, I'm fascinated to hear how that came about um, and about your whole mindset and thought process when I assume you had to make quite a big decision to make that shift. So I'd love to hear all about that, uh, that transition. Yeah, so... Um... I had a traditional academic background that was always focused on becoming a solicitor. So from GCSE to A-levels to my degree as a doing a law degree, I always knew that I wanted to be a solicitor. It was in my family, so it was just a natural progression for me to follow after my mother. Um, so after law school, I went on to practice in the City of London, where I qualified and... Um, was I think I was about three years PQE when I went out for a drink after work one night um, and was just stopped in the pub by someone who said, sorry, what, what do you do for a living? And I was like, I'm, I'm a solicitor, why? And she's like, oh, I'm, I'm a model scout. I'm looking for someone that looks just like you. And I was like, that doesn't sound right. Like in my head, I'm not this archetypal model. You know, I'm not blonde, blue eyed full of muscles, you know, like when I think of the model, I, I think of like Jason Morgan or David Gandhi, like that sort of like really strong 90s, early noughties, really, really masculine aesthetic. That's what a male model was to me as I was growing up. Um, so I sort of laughed it off and I was like, oh, good joke. And she was like, no, seriously, can I take your, take your picture um, and your contact details? And if anything comes from it, I'll, I'll send you a, a message. And then a few days later, my phone went and they were like, can you come in? for a meeting with Tandy um, Anderson, who was the head of Select, still is the head of Select. Um, and they signed me on the spot. And then two days later, I was walking in a show in London Fashion Week. Wow, was that quick? A, yeah, but then a, a week later, I was walking in a show in Paris. And then a week after that, I was walking in a show in Milan. So it, it kind of escalated really quickly. And I wasn't really prepared for what that meant because I was obviously working full-time as a solicitor. Um, but then on, say, Thursday evening after the first show, I was having to make my excuses to disappear out of the office to go to Paris to walk in a show <laughs> Friday morning. Yeah. And then when the next show came in on uh, Fabrioni in, in Milan, that was like a Wednesday. So I was like, oh, I kind of need a day off. Um, didn't want to tell them why. Yeah. So I just... I just booked some time off and disappeared to Milan and did this show. And then I was just, I wasn't really prepared for the fact that these images would be in the public realm. I didn't think that through. I just thought I'd go and do this and it would be cool. It'd be a fun adventure. I won't have to tell anyone if it doesn't work out, but yeah, the pictures were in the public realm straight away. Obviously they're in the magazines and in the press and online. Um, so it was one of those things that I kind of had to make a decision quite quickly to tell my partner at the law firm that this is what I'd been doing when I had those days off because I didn't want them finding out before me, uh, before me having the chance to tell them. So um, we actually did a big fashion editorial for The Guardian, um, maybe a week after I got back from Milan. And I was like, oh my God, like everyone in the office reads The Guardian. Yeah. Like, I'm going to have to tell everyone. <laughs> So I went, I went in and told the managing partner and my partner, and I was like, listen, just be aware that when The Guardian comes out this weekend or this week, or I can't even remember what date it was. I think it might have been the weekend supplement. I'm going to be in there about 10 pages of me. <laughs> <laughs> that Thinking must have been a fascinating doing. conversation. <laughs> yeah, to them, they're like, well, why are you doing this? This makes no sense to them. 
and it made no sense to me, but it was an opportunity I wanted to explore. I didn't want to be that guy that sat there with his grandkids at the age of 70 and went, oh, your grandfather, he had this opportunity once. He could have done something really interesting with his life rather than just doing what he was trained to do for his whole life. So I just thought I'd take the opportunity and see where it led. And then six months after it, the initial conversation and the first show, I actually moved to New York and got my visa and was living in New York on and off for a long time. I got back in, I think, 2015, full time, moved in with Melissa, got a dog, got engaged. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story. So, I mean, was it, yeah. was, it, was, it, was, it a, was it a tough decision for you to move away from from law i mean it's obviously three years of training and i think you did then uh, three more years of sort of professional training out in in the job it sounds like it was a, it was sort of a heritage thing that came from your mum that was sort of why that led you towards law in the first place which is something that i relate to because my parents are both dentists and and obviously i'm now a dentist as well <clears throat> but did, was there any part of you that was like oh god i'm very, i'm i'm i mean i'm sure there was i'm scared about making this transition, will I lose my career as a solicitor and everything I've worked so hard for? But did that play through in your head at the time, or was it just this is just too good an opportunity to give up? No, totally. I was completely conflicted the whole time along. Obviously, uh, like you say, it's I did a four year degree, then I did a year at law school, then I did two years as a trainee, and then I qualified to do the job I'd wanted to do my whole life. Yeah, six so years. It was a long time. It's like you guys, you train a long time to do this job that you built up in your head that you wanted to do since you were a child. So I was doing my job and I was good at my job and I loved my job. Um, there was just something about this opportunity that I felt at the back of my head. I couldn't not at least try to explore, which is why I kind of like dipped my toe into it at the beginning without fully going in 100%. I, I should have like clarified. I didn't actually go full time as a model until I moved to New York. Oh, okay. So there, That's was, there was a six month period where I was holding down my full time job. Yeah. Also, somehow traveling around the world, doing fashion shows, you know, shooting these amazing campaigns in London, Paris, Milan, um, with some incredible photographers. When I first started, I had such an amazing run working with some amazing amazing household names and it got to a point where i'd taken a bit too much time off and um i think i'd actually run out of annual leave but uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it was like january no do you know what i mean i'd yeah. run out <laughs> and so i was now thinking to myself okay right you're not going to be able to disappear as easy as you've been disappearing to do these jobs um so i spoke to my partner i was like I can remember it really well. I had this job in Ibiza, actually, um, shooting with Merton Marcus, who were just like, you know, the rock and roll stars of the fashion industry. And I was like, I've got to go and do this job, but it's four days in Ibiza. And they were like, you don't have four days holiday. We, and we're so busy, we can't offer you offer you the break. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm really, I really need to do this job. So is there any way we can make it work? So I worked late, I did this, I did that, found the time, then took it off as unpaid leave. But then on the way back, I was like, I had another option come in. And I think it was actually, um, yeah, it was for the following week. I was like, I can't, I can't do this. It was with Marcus again. I was like, it's for GQ Turkey. I was like, I can't do this because instantly they're just going to say no. So yeah. in the back of my mind, I was like, oh, wow, it's coming to an end. I've got to make a decision now. Do I want to go and do this amazing job that I'm super excited to explore to see where it takes me? Because it was taking me around the world. I was meeting new people. I was traveling. It was it was fun but at the same time do i want to turn my back on something i trained so hard for and that was secure and safe and was going to look after me for the rest of my life um and take me on an academic exploration of, of me as a person rather than a, a a creative exploration of me as a person yeah which at the time i didn't even know that was a choice i thought i would go and model and be a model for a little bit and then i'd go back to being a lawyer i never factored in the fact that 10 years later I'd still be modeling and I would own a creative um, and artistic direction business that was now creating these visuals and these products for the luxury brands that I was so desperate to work for. So it's, it was an amazing journey really. And one that w wasn't ever planned. So that's serendipitous. That's the best thing about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there certainly was that element of luck, but I mean, 
there's there's a lot of hard work hard work that goes into it as well for sure and i mean you mentioned you mentioned there that there's a lot of travel there's a lot of moving around involved with modeling um and um i've seen you say somewhere that you sort of try to dial that down a bit in 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 your sort of more experienced years as a model is that something that you still thrive on or is it something that you struggle with um and are there any sort of with 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 so much change every day i mean you get a job and you you have to go here you have to go there i imagine it's quite difficult to maintain structure in your life is there any are there any sort of key things that you do daily routines or anything like that to try and um create structure where there isn't any in your it's not like a nine to five job yeah i mean obviously we're in in a very strange time we're we're in the middle of of the the most unprecedented um Pandemic, global pandemic that has, has really caused our way of working to change a lot, which has meant for us we're uh, more often than not at home at the moment because it's it's difficult to to shoot these big productions because you know there's often a lot of people on set and it's it's very close quarters so a lot of work has, has stopped um, obviously because of the restrictions then also because consumer confidence has fallen out from the marketplace so who wants to to spend money on promoting product to sell when there's no consumers to buy it. But if we look at, um, say, like the, the two or three year period preceding this, yeah, like you said, in the, in the last few years, I've really tried to stop traveling because it had become quite a lot. Um, I do still always do in January and June, I'll do the menswear shows. So I'll do London then Florence for pity. Then I'll go on to Milan and Paris. I do that twice a year. But other than that, we've tried to really keep the work um, quite centric to Europe and London. I don't really go to New York as much because I was finding I was doing, um, at one point I was doing like maybe three or four flights a month. Um, and it just made you so unproductive once you got home because you, you were just all over the place. You, you couldn't sit down and work on anything. So we sort of just tried to narrow down what focus on what we wanted to do, who we wanted to work with, and then try to make that small core group of, of clients our main focus and, and we actually decided that Britain would be our main hub and, and we'd really focus on British brands, British manufacturing, British sustainability. And that really became what I was known for. Um, in terms of what you were asking earlier about having a structure to my life, I've never really been a, a very structured person. I've always been quite um, fluid, I think is the most polite term. So you, <laughs> Don't feel uh, you need to be polite. <laughs> yeah, dynamic. I've been quite dynamic. You know, um, all my best intentions are to have a really structured regimented <clears throat> lifestyle but um you know all best laid plans and all that always goes to um goes to get thrown out the window so at the moment we sort of Melissa and I are forcing ourselves to get up and out of bed like at the same time we'd normally get up so seven thirty eight, but that isn't always isn't always the case because we don't have anything to get up to get up for sometimes and when you don't have something to get up for, it makes everything so much harder. Like your mental health really struggles because you have no purpose, you have no function, you have no drive. So if I'm crawling out of bed at 9.30, it's because I have to get up and take the dog out for a walk. But once I've taken the dog out for a walk, then you feel refreshed. You've had your coffee, you've had your green juice, you're up, you've got the news on, you're getting informed. Then you're doing some exercise after lunch, taking the dog out again for a little walk, reading some books, going through some art, um, Melissa and I are just obsessed with photography books. So we're constantly trawling through photography books and trawling through the internet, looking for inspiration or for projects. I should say Melissa is my fiance and she's an, an art director and a stylist as well. So she's constantly working on things with me or for me or, you know, helping me to you know, inspire me to, to create. So it's like, I don't know. I'm just looking around the house now, and it's just books everywhere. Every every corner I'm looking at is books, books. Any books, any so. any books that you uh, that are particularly special to you, or that you found have given you the most inspiration? Um, there's there's like a photography book. Like I love photography books from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. There's just something so so wonderful about seeing someone's film photography um in a book you know we have digital photography now we still have film but we don't really use it as much but when you see that sort of slow paced film-based photography shot in a really busy crazy city like i'm looking at um there's a fred herzog book there and there's a robert maplethorpe book there and they're both shot in new york 
one's in the 70s and I think one's in the 50s. And you have this crazy, crazy busy city being shot on the slowest form of analog film known to man. It's just a really nice juxtaposition. And there's always such nice richness and depth to, to analog film that we don't really get with digital now. So, yeah, that's that's two books that I can see in my eye line. That we can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, I mean, I, I've never had a photography. I, I'm intensely passionate about photography. I love um I love taking photos. I love taking video. Looking behind the the camera here, I've got about three lenses, and uh, my wife always is telling me to stop buying camera gear, and I, I do have a bit of an addiction to it. But I, I never actually had a book before, and uh, I was I was at Time uh, in the Cotswolds, the the hotel, and um, they had this uh, David Yarrow book, um, which uh, which I just sat down and just started reading while we were waiting for our room to get, become available, and uh, yeah. it's amazing actually. I've, I've never sat down and literally sort of paged through a photography book before. Um, I'll see photos that I like and, and that sort of artistically I'm I'm interested in, but I've never sat down and sort of paged through a book like that before and sort of read it almost like a bit of a story, like a, a photographic yeah. story. Um, and yeah, I've, I've I've actually just bought it and it's sitting in my um, sitting in my lounge now because it was um, yeah. it really it really actually hit me in a in a way that I haven't haven't been hit before. I mean, I tend to read. Yeah. Uh, non-fiction sort of self-development type um, books when I when I sit down to read anything. So this was this was a completely different yeah. um, part of me, which I found quite interesting actually. Yeah, it's a, a well laid out photo book. It's a visual, it's a visual narrative. It will take you from A to B. Like a lot of them are either geographically based on uh, explorate, exploratory narrative or timeline based on an exploratory narrative mm. to see how their photography has, has changed over the years. Um, if I'm reading non-fiction, this is so geeky, I actually am really into Russian science fiction from the mid-century. So, yeah, we probably don't even want to touch on that. So. <laughs> I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> where does that come from? Um, where does it come from? <clears throat> so I've got two brothers both are big into uh, philosophy and politics um, and science fiction. And it comes from late night conversations sitting there saying, oh, have you read this? Have you read that? Um, have you read this philosopher? Have you read this science fiction book? And then we all found that coming out of um, Poland and Russia in like this sort of like between 1930 to 1950 was all this crazy integrated philosophy, science fiction stuff. And so we kind of like set ourselves down this this line, uh, this, this, we went down a wormhole, let's be honest. And we're reading books by like Asimov and Lem. And, and these guys are absolute pioneers of not only philosophy, but science fiction from um, Russia and Poland in like the early 50s. It's mind blowing. And, and do, you, are they, are they, are, do you read them as philosophies that you can implement into your own life? Is that, is that what you get out of those? Uh, not not really they're not that sort of, they're not like introspective philosophies they're more external ones it's you know this was uh human condition stuff you know man should be doing this man should be going out exploring the universe and what does he find when he gets there he finds a mirror reflection of his own uh flaws you know that sort of thing uh, solaris for example you've seen the film solaris no no it's, it's like a really famous uh, book by um i think it was by stanislaw lem um and have you read you know uh, igor asimov he wrote i robot you know that's super famous. okay yeah, yeah. that was in the 50s really that's, i didn't know that that's from the 50s that's crazy you know it's like yeah um it's just about exploring the human condition so as, as most russian philosophers did at the time um yeah i don't actually read any sort of like self-help like philosophy stuff but like, you know i went through a transitional period in my life about three and a half years ago where i got clean and sober so i did a lot of introspective work on who i am as a person back then in um, in meetings so you know i have done it but not so much so for fun <laughs> yeah yeah and then is it did do you feel that you did the work then and, and that carries through now you don't feel any need to maintain oh, yeah. um and how how do you do how do you how do you maintain now like are there things that you do that you feel you have to do you have to there's it's like a constant thing it's you know you can't just say one day i'm going to give up all of these vices and then hope for 
the vices to leave you alone forever. You have to make a conscious choice to leave them behind. And then you have to implement a structure and routine into your life that works. <clears throat> um, and there are structures and routines that work super well and have worked for decades and decades. Um, and so I just chose one that worked for me and, um, and I, and I, I do that. And that was through like, at the beginning it was group meetings one-on-one -on -one meetings a lot of reading of, of the literature um, and you learn so much in such a short space of time from the people you meet that you take you almost take every single one of them and the literature on this journey with you and it's constantly with you and you're conscious constantly looking at it and um, looking in on yourself um, so you're constantly managing your own state of mind and you're pushing yourself to become a better person. It's hard, don't get me wrong. You know, I'm not yeah. winning every day. I'm definitely not winning every day. You can ask Mel, some days I'm definitely not winning. But I'd rather be winning some days than no days. Yeah. Well, no one wins every day. I think that's an important thing for people to understand that people may, from the outside looking in, seem to be always happy, but that's not that's not reality no nobody stays in a constant state of happiness it's it's not healthy right. it's not healthy to do so you can't have the the light without the darkness everything is is a balance right yeah i mean i think the problem we have to move on from what you were saying about people's external perception always being happy is that we live in a world now where everyone is so focused on how they appear to everyone else they almost forego how they feel inside because it's so much more important for them to have this external facade of happiness on their social media or um, to their to their family and, and friends. It's yeah, I think it's almost seen as a sign of weakness now. Just say, hold on a minute, I'm not feeling great. I'm, can someone you know put your hand up? I need some help. Can someone help me? Whereas it shouldn't be a form of weakness. It should almost be seen as a form of strength because you're strong enough inside to need to ask for the help. It's kind of like topsy turvy. That, that's yeah, I, I completely agree. I think the more someone can express their vulnerability, I think the, the stronger they are as a human being. Because once you've expressed your vulnerability, what what? How can anyone come at you with anything? Because you've already expressed how vulnerable you are. So it's it's a, an interesting, as you say, it, it needs to be flipped on its head a little bit. But I was actually gonna, I was going to speak to you about social media later because, or as in in this talk because. As, as someone involved in the fashion industry, I mean, the fashion industry and social media, they are integrally linked. Um, and I'm interested because for, for me, knowing you, you're sort of at the antithesis of, a, of, a, of an influencer, in inverted commas, whatever that is, yeah. right? in, that you, in that you're not yeah. sort of self-promoting self and, and you're very considered about the way that you, um, uh, the way that you communicate, I think. What's your relationship like with social media? Do you do you hate it? Do you accept it? Do you um, is it something that you uh, you begrudge or are you quite interested in it? Um, I think at the beginning, uh, obviously, I'm sort of of the age where like Facebook blew my mind when I got Facebook. I was like, wow, like what is this? Like we were doing university, I think we just finished university actually. I was like, wow, like never seen anything like this my friends are all on this page and i can see their pictures and i can talk to them this is great and so that like first like introduction to it was so positive and then i think over the years you sort of realized through various news channels and documentaries and newspapers that you know they're all out there harvesting all our data but you know, we sign up for that. We know that. So I'm not one of these guys who's big against, who's against like big tech harvesting our data. Like we, at the end of the day, we are the product for them and they are monetizing us by giving us the content we want so they can, they can make money off of us buying that, that, those products. And as long as you're aware of that, I think it's fine. It's for the people that aren't aware of that, that it's maybe a little bit worse, but, um, for me, in terms of my personal relationship with it, I'm fine with it. It's a communications tool. It enables me to communicate with the outside world, uh, to share my work, to share other people, like for, first and foremost, to share other people's work, people that I know, people that I don't know. It enables me to, to act as a conduit to, to share in 
what they've created because there are so many amazing photographers, stylists, you know, like art directors, um, furniture makers, like everyone, like every creator, like they, they're making something so special. And if, if you like what you see, then you get an opportunity to share it and you never know where that one share will take that one person. It could, could go anywhere. Um, so I, I'm all for it as long as it's, as long as you're aware of the, the downsides of the platform. Um, yeah. you know, there's some bad stuff lurking out there, but as long as you're able to manage that, that's fine. So it's not something that really has a particularly positive or negative feeling to you. Just you, you, you use it for what suits you in essence, and and leave it at the yeah. door. Yeah, it's like email. Like remember when they introduced the email? Um, you would use it to talk to your friends. So that was my Facebook equivalent. And then as you grew older, email became an everyday necessity in your life that enabled you to communicate at work in 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 your work group outside of your work group so as a visual as a visual creator i hate that term visual creator just as much as i hate the term visual influencer but um <laughs> as, a, as a as a man that specializes in a visual medium the only way to communicate that other than in print magazines is online so you're limited to your facebook's your twitter's and your instagram's so for me, it is a communications tool that I view in the same way as I view my outlook. It's a yeah. business tool. It enables me to interact with people. It enables me to share my my likes and dislikes and it enables me to share other people's work and, and to create more business opportunities and to share business opportunities around with everyone else. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we met on social media. So, I mean, that's, there's some positives there, right? Yeah, you see in front of the <laughs> <laughs> i did i did indeed um right let's let's move on this so there's there's a point that i've got here which i think is yeah. really interesting for me it was certainly very interesting for me when i first met you which is i view you as a a perfect example of a gentleman and what, and what i mean by that is um when you come into my practice um and, and I, I look after you your, your dental needs um a lot of people will come in and they, they just focus on, on me as the dentist because they come in, they speak to the dentist, that's it. That's the person they're there to see. They do that job and then they leave. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, as many of my patients are, but it's a special type of person, are super, super engaging with, with everyone you meet. I, I can hear you chatting with reception from upstairs and, and having sort of really like enjoyable conversations with them. You come upstairs, you have a chat with Grace, my nurse, see how she's doing. You're really engaged in the conversation with her. It's not a platitude or, or anything false. It's a genuine engagement um, with everyone that you come, that you come into. And, and I, I think that's a very, very uh, admirable um, characteristic. Um, and I'm interested to know, like you're, you're a very sociable person. You're a great orator. You're quite from from what most people would call confident is is that something that you think you've honed through through your your law degree and and, and through into to just the environment that you live in within fashion or have you always had a, an integral confidence from childhood or is that something your parents instilled into you i don't know it's a tough one because i would never really particularly say i'm i'm a confident person i think i learned at a young age that if you hold yourself in a certain way, you will be able to move through life with ease. So if I, I don't know, I don't know how old I was when I figured it out, but if I am outgoing and gregarious and happy and engaging in conversation, people will make my life easier and my life will become easier because I, I won't be doing myself a disservice as I move through this world so i wouldn't say I, I was particularly confident as a child growing up but i taught myself how to be a certain way um, i love talking to people i love engaging with people meeting new people talking about friends family um politics whatever whatever any, whatever anyone wants to talk about I, I do love conversing we're human beings we all have such a different perspective on on everything and there are so many human beings out there that can teach me something. So yeah, I do always love talking to people. And I mean, at the end of the day, what, what does it cost us as humans to be polite and cordial to each other and to make somebody else's day 
110 percent better than it could have potentially been a moment ago um so i don't know i always try and i don't know i, I remember my manners I, I was brought up by my mum and dad to, to be polite and respectful and, and uh, i know i just love i do love chatting rubbish to people again <laughs> <laughs> i just love chatting rubbish um, we do we do have a, a we do have a, a, a vast ranging array of topics that we chat about in the dental chair don't yeah. we so we, we have to try yeah. and concentrate on doing some work sometimes <laughs> yeah i feel like i might have digressed from your original question somewhere but um yeah it's a try and to try and cut to the short of it i wouldn't say i was a particularly confident person but i've developed um an external confidence over the years whether it be through my my own personal decision making my academic um, education. Um, obviously, as a lawyer, you cannot be a shy wallflower. You have to be brave and confident and outgoing because otherwise you'll get uh, chewed up and spat out by the industry, um, to put it kindly. Um, and then obviously in the fashion industry, who's shy in the fashion industry? I mean, I don't think I've met one shy model or one shy photographer. Or, I mean, everyone is outgoing and gregarious and and confident. And it's a big shouting contest sometimes on set as they, my ideas are better my ideas are better than your ideas. Here's why they're better. So as long as you... That's interesting. So as long as you're... And this isn't on my set when I'm running a production, by the way. My <laughs> team, we never talk over each other. But yeah, I've been on sets where there's a lot of creatives and, you know, there's a lot of personalities and there's a lot of people talking over each other and there's a lot of tension because of it. So I don't know, I'm quite pragmatic. I like to think the more you can listen to your team around you and the people around you, the more you can deliver a, a solution to everyone's problems. So, I don't know. Give a little, take a little, talk a little, listen a little. Yeah. I'm, well, I imagine it can be quite I'm a cutthroat right. industry, I'm right? right. So, I imagine it can be quite a cutthroat industry, as you say, with a lot of, a lot of egos, a lot of people. I mean, it, it, there's, a very, there's very few positions available to be in your career, whether that be the photographer or the art director or the model. Each yeah, of those people, a, I imagine, is grateful to, to be in that position because it's, there's not that many opportunities, especially at the top of the game like you are. But same as, same as you. There's, there's not how many dentists are there. Yeah, you can train, but it doesn't mean you're going to qualify. And then you're not going to get practice. You know, you're never, it's, it's, it's the same. If, no matter what industry you go to, there's going to be um, a pool of talent that want to do certain jobs and those jobs are restricted to a limited amount of numbers. So on the way up to the top of that pyramid, you have maybe at the bottom uh, a lot of friendship and adulation and uh, congratulations. And as you slowly, slowly start creeping up, it gets lesser and lesser and lesser and more competitive and more competitive until, you know, there are times where I guess you're competing with your friends, uh, you're competing with people you've known for a long time for, for this one job. and you know, you don't always get it. And, and what I've learned is I can actually be just as happy for my friends getting a job as if now, now, than as if I got the job. I will celebrate my friends' victories like, I, like they were my own. And that's something that's only come with age, but I'm so glad I've got that in me. And it's something that I really genuinely mean. And I, I don't have the converse where I'm really angry that I haven't been getting work and I haven't been doing this. And so I'm quite lucky in that respect. We, we. I mean, you mentioned that it's more so now. Were you, were you, did you feel the need to be more competitive in your earlier stages before you sort of cemented your position, or was it just well, something that just as, as your as your character well, has developed with age, you've become more balanced and? So at the beginning, when I moved into this industry, what I didn't realise was there's nothing you can do about your face. <laughs> you look the way you look, and that is that. So I went into this industry thinking, oh, well, like, yeah, we'll see how it goes. We'll see what jobs I get, you know. And I got some great jobs. And I was like, oh, shit, this is great. And I was working my way up and I was going up and up. And then you get to a point and you're kind of like, oh, well, why am I not doing this job? Why am I not doing that job? And you're kind of like asking the casting directors, what did I do wrong? Or you're asking your agent, what did I do wrong? And they've got no answer. Your face just doesn't fit. So the sooner you recognize that your face just doesn't fit, the better, because... Nothing good can sorry, Vinny's just barking. Nothing good can come from um, being insecure in the industry you work in for a reason that you cannot change. 
it just breeds bitterness and resentment and you don't want that so i put that in the bin <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for the for the benefit of your mental health i'm sure yeah i mean i'm not am i a competitive person i always played sports i always wanted to win but i wasn't sort of that guy that would do or die to win. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So is that because I, I wasn't always competitive? I just wanted to be the best at what I did. If I, whether it was, whether I was at law school, I wanted to be the best. I wanted to know it inside and out and I wanted to be the best, but I didn't want to, I don't know. What's the word I'm for? I wanted to be the best, but I wasn't openly competitive about it. I kept myself to myself. Mm. Uh, and, and then in, in this industry, the only way you can, prove you're good at what you do is by delivering great results on set for the client. So if you're a model, you turn up, you're, you're polite, you're cordial, you're friendly, you're on time. That's the most important thing. You're on you, time. I, 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 actually, I forgot to mention that earlier. You are always 10 minutes early for your appointment, at least. Oh, and you travel from the other side always. of town as well. And so many of my patients will, will arrive late and you have, you've never been anything but early. And that's, that's another thing that yeah. I find is just such an important thing. I mean, it's such a small thing for lots of people, but it's it just shows it shows who you are as an individual. I think, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I didn't realise uh, how big a thing my punctuality was until I don't know until I was uh, maybe about thirty two, thirty three, and it became this thing. Which would be he's always fifteen minutes, always ten minutes early. He's always already got everyone coffees. He's already you know set up, ready to go. And I was like, oh wow! I just thought that was me. Mm. I thought that was normal. I just it was just how I operate. And then you know you, you soon realise that yeah, there's there's a completely different perspective on life that you're just kind of like just scrape by by the skin of your teeth and you'll get there just on time. Or if not, you'll be ten, twenty, thirty minutes late and you won't even bother telling anyone you're late. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've always, always been on time. Yeah. Always been I love early. That. I love that. Like 10, 15 minutes got to be there early. So you, you mentioned a bit about, um, about being, about competitiveness and sport earlier. And I, I read a really interesting quote from you and apologies if I'm misquoting you here or, or paraphrasing, but that you felt that, that masculinity and that sort of alpha male, um, persona, um, yeah. has become a bit of a, a negative toxic thing and that actually, it leads to a lot of um, mental health issues in men, more so in men than in women who are more willing to to be more vulnerable and be more expressive about their emotions. Is that is that is that is that a fair is that is that your can you speak to that a little bit? Is that is that a fair assumption of, of where you th- where your thoughts are on this? Yeah, well, you, you paraphrase me well. <laughs> uh, I don't. I mean, other than that now paraphrasing you, paraphrasing me, you know, is to be a man in the 21st century is is a tough place to be because you have been brought up on these notions of um, of how your father was to be a man and how your grandfather was to be a man and oh my god your grandfather's father wow he was a man he was killing bears with his bare hands <laughs> you know I mean? this guy didn't cry he punched a bear to death you know it's like um, so men have been for a long time, men have been forced by their history, not to convey their emotions because it's not the same thing to do. Whereas now we find ourselves in the 21st century and we're all ultra connected. We're, we're as open as we've ever been. And, and sometimes men just can't, can't find a way to process that. Um, you know, you can see that from the male suicide figures. It's, Crazy. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Um, so for me, the, the idea, the, the word toxic masculinity, I guess it it manifests itself in this idea that men have to be strong. They have to be silent. They have to be money winners. They have to support the family. They have to go to the pub with their friends, drink their beer and have fights. That's just not acceptable as a notion anymore in the 21st century for me. It's, we should just be sort of looking in on ourselves and, and realizing that that's that wall of silence that we've inherited through our father, grandfather, great grandfather, not even deliberately, 
just as a societal construct you inherited this wall of silence needs to be broken down even if it's just talking like this to you if this podcast was going nowhere and it was just me and you this would still be a cathartic conversation for the two of us to have yeah because we're touching on things that we do not talk about every day and so i think the important thing is to remember that you have to if you're feeling a certain way you should talk about it it doesn't matter who you talk to you could sit next to someone at the bus stop and talk about how you feel they might not want to listen but you talking is is productive for you yeah absolutely a problem shared is, is a problem half as they say I do, I do think that's a fair and true um phrase mate i say that phrase so often and i feel like there is no simpler way to put it whether you say it or you're texting it to someone or emailing it i'd rather someone tells me there's a problem so i can help them with it it's literally a physical burden you're carrying with you that will drag you down unless you have someone helping you to, to carry that burden yeah absolutely and i think i think it's so important that people realize that and people realize and have more empathy i guess for for others especially on social media where there is trolling and negativity and all that sort of stuff to actually flip your immediate reaction to be uh, reflectively negative to that individual and think actually they clearly are not able to express their feelings about things in a constructive way they have inner demons that they're battling with and um actually potentially you should be more empathetic to that individual and, and checking on them and see if they're okay which is probably the opposite of what you want to do yeah it's it's a tough one because it's not really what it's not the reaction they want either no they want that and if you're offering them that like a, you can't really see on my screen if you're offering them that, that's a hug by the way <laughs> a virtual if you're hug offering them that, yeah if you're offering them that rather than that they don't, again it is it, it's, it makes them feel awkward because you know they're whatever they're they're battling internally you know whatever anger whatever the cause or the root of this anger is yeah they're, they're, they're just not they're not amenable to that they want that so yeah online if i get any of that they just get blocked straight away i, I went through a period of, it, of engaging with people to like really bottom out what's i actually was like can ask Melissa. It was eating me up. I was engaging with these guys, and I was like, "What is wrong? Why don't you like this? What is it that specifically that you don't like about me or this image? Tell me everything, and I will make it better for you." Um, not as in make their problems better for them, but I will talk you through what this image means to me, and I will make you like it as much as I like it. Yeah, <laughs> which probably isn't what they want. But you know, I found myself defending myself to strangers at three in the morning for hours on end, and I was like, "What am I doing?" Just block them. So that's what we do now. Just get rid of them. Just not, I haven't got time for negative energy in my life. It's just Absolutely. too much negative energy in the world as there is. I don't need it in my life. Yeah, well, I mean, it's out of your control, isn't it? So it's a, it's a great it's a great way to be. And, I, and a lot of people who have high profiles have said exactly the same thing to me. The, the block button is, is very frequently used. <laughs> well, I feel, you feel bad using it because, well, why should I... This got, I don't know, it's so hard because it is physically and emotionally exhausting battling online bullying. I've never been bullied online, but I've seen people and I know people that have, and oh my God, it leaves them in bits. So yeah, for them, wow, what a godsend that there's a block button. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I hope that as we transition with our relationship as 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 a species with social media that it, it the frameworks become better against bullying because one of my biggest concerns is when we were kids i mean i'm a, we're, we're of a similar era we were at school if there was bullying going on it was it was left at school you got home and you were in a safe space with your with your family um yeah. whereas now I, I feel i feel for the kids so badly because if they are getting bullied that's that just comes home with them and, and follows them everywhere and it, it must be so difficult for them no i totally agree with you like it's, this is a conversation i've had as well it's like you know whatever manifested itself at school in the 80s 90s um in terms of bullying whether it was mental or physical you knew the moment you got through that school gate you could run home to your mum and dad and everything would be all right and you would have that safety until you went back to school the next day until you found the courage to speak up against it to your teachers or actually stand up to the bullies themselves, which, you know, more often than not was the way to do it. You, you know, 
to stand up to a bully and they don't really know what to do. But now this this world of ultra interconnectivity, mobile phones and computers and tablets and, you know, the screens are everywhere. And on each one of these screens, some of these kids has got someone telling them they're worthless. It's just, I just feel so sorry for them. I don't really know how you can go about rectifying this issue unless we do all have to have an online electronic passport that allows us to log into every app and therefore we can be held accountable for everything that's said mm. you know we have we have one user profile that exists everywhere a bit like wechat in um, china actually and then you are held accountable for your behavior on that but yeah at the moment it's lax severely lax yeah, hopefully. I mean, I, the only way I can see it working is if some sort of artificial intelligence, some sort of deep learning begins to see unacceptable behavior, it can actually track it in some way, whether that be the language or even deeper than that, and actually it understands the words being written. And it and it either blocks it or as you say, as you say, it, it's tracked in some way. Uh, that's the only way I could see it being uh, improved, really, because you can't stop people from free speech, can you? That's the difficulty. No, well, that's the big argument at the moment, isn't it? What what is what is um, what's the best way? What is capable of censorship, and who should deem what is capable of censorship? Yeah. Should these organisations be um, blocking the Trump. baseline? Mark yeah. Yeah, should they, should they be the guys that are saying, right, here's the baseline of what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable as a corporate entity? Because they all have, unfortunately, got ulterior motives at play yeah. as to who they, should, who they shouldn't block. But as a baseline, if you're a young kid and you're being spoken to in a way that is making your life hell, man, they don't deserve to have the privilege of a social media account. They should have it taken away from them. Yeah, absolutely. I think the key thing that I'll try and instill in, in my children is just to have that innate confidence as much as possible. And it's very difficult to, I think, and I think about this a lot, how I'm going to instill confidence in my children without creating arrogance when they're developing and, and changing so much. But I think having yeah. that integral confidence is so important for everything in life, really. The, the ability to stand up, and, stand up and talk in front of a crowd or to to perform under pressure on the sports field or whatever your, your area of passion is, confidence makes such a difference, I think, even if you have to force it. As yeah, no, I agree. Like, like, sorry, like you said earlier, like this, you want them to be confident without coming across arrogant. That's a super fine line. So, but I think the way to instill confidence in, in your kids and just the way I, I had the confidence instilled in, in my life is just, positive reassurance, informing them as much as possible about the positives of academia. You know, you know, the, the pen is mightier than the sword. If we're going to keep going back to all these little one-liners <laughs> yeah. that we've, we've learned, the pen is mightier than the sword. There is nothing better than a sharp brain. And the moment you realize you've got a sharp brain, that confidence will come, come from it. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to switch switch topics a little bit here, just for the for the final part of the of the chat. And I want to I want to dive into um, your experience as as a, a fashion designer working with fashion brands to create your own collections. I know it's something that you're really passionate about, and um, it's been awesome to see. I think you've done three collections now with um, King and Tuckfield, and you just launched your uh, footwear capsule collection with um, with Joseph Cheney and Sons last year. Um, so I'd lo I'd love to hear about your experiences of that, um, and also why I, I know sustainability and responsible sourcing and, and ethical manufacture is such an important thing for you. So why that's become such a, I mean it's it's, it's the front line, um, it's the almost the strap line of these of both these collections that you've um, that you've launched with these sort of heritage brands. So yeah, I'd love to hear a bit more about about those opportunities. Yeah. So. Um... Firstly, I'd say I'd never call myself a designer. I would say I was a creative director, mainly because I do not hold the innate skill set as an individual to design something. What I would do is I will move into an organization or a business and I will put the right people in the right places to create something together. 
So it's a bit like a football manager, do you know what I mean? Right. I'll put yep. the right team. Wrong terminology they... for me there. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just, I just always am wary that designers are incredible human beings that can single handedly reinvent the wheel. Whereas I need a team of people around me to take my vision yep. and realize it for me. So I would say I'm a creative director, which almost means like I'm a football manager. Like I come up with the tactics and the ideas and the story and the narrative and the visuals. And then the team around me help me to implement to all of those yeah. philosophies and to bring it to life. Yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> the opportunity to develop that skill set came uh, from Stacey Wood of, of King and Tuckfield, who, who so kindly let me into her studio and taught me a hell of a lot about a hell of a lot from design to you know, everything I know about sustainability really comes from Stacey. Like, it, it's, it's a tough one. It, it's such a, I'll, I'll try and do it on a linear time scale. So Stacey invited me into the studio. She was like, why don't, she like, she saw something in me, an innate, an innate um, desire and want and uh, drive to always want to create like super high quality imagery in my art direction work. And she was like, you are super stylish as well. So there is something in you that would translate really well to designing or helping us to create a collection of clothes. You know, you you have that that baseline skill set. So I was like, oh, I'm not sure. Like, but she persuaded me, and then we um, I sat down with her, and I was like, I was just blown away by everything that goes into making and um, making a product. You know, it all starts with, for example, I'll take a a merino sweatshirt it all starts with a sheep farm in in new zealand um and if you're trying to be sustainable fully sustainable you'll go and visit that sheep farm and you'll audit that sheep farm and make sure that those animals are being looked after and then once you've audited that sheep farm you'll you'll come home and you'll you'll place your order the order will go to the meal you've selected that you've also audited and then it will go from the mill to the garment factory and the garment will be made that you've also audited that garment factory. Um, and all along the line, you're not just auditing the, the way they operate as a business. You're, you're also auditing how they operate um, environmentally and socially. How do they treat their people? How do they treat the planet? And then before you know it, like this jump has turned up on your desk. It's just, I'm, just, I'm still mind blown by by the way that the industry works um and i'm so lucky to be able to say I'm a, I'm a part of it like actively contributing to trying to make a difference to to not only the british fashion industry by trying to champion sustainability ethics and responsibility but also you know trying to do my bit individually you know reducing my own footprint but also educating other people to reduce their footprint and by actively speaking out against those brands that are not reducing their footprint, that are doing things wrong. So that, that's the sort of position I find myself in now. Like I, I'm a spokesman and advocate of brand Britain, of craftsmanship, heritage, sustainability. Um, and I also like to speak out against those people that, that are doing it wrong. Um, and what's the, and without, what's the impact um, for... For listeners who may not be as as well uh, informed um, as us around the sort of impact of, of fast fashion and um, yeah. a lack of sustainable thinking in from the from some of the bigger brands, some of the the big household name yeah. brands that we all know, um, what what's the impact of that on the environment and and are they really making a change? Because obviously everyone's greenwashing everything now. Everyone is sustainable apparently because all of a sudden. Um, are they really? Um, and um, um, yeah, as I said, what's the impact on the environment of fashion? Okay. So this, this is a, will be a super, super long, in-depth, crazy answer if you let me go. <laughs> but I will try to be as concise as possible. So first things first, to put it into perspective, the fashion industry is second only to none. I sound like I'm reading off a script. I've just said it so many times. Oh, yeah. The fashion industry is second only to none, a second only to the petrochemical industry in terms of the damage we do to the environment how mad is that Crazy. we make clothes but we're only beaten by the petrochemical engineering industry in terms of the damage we do when we make those clothes 
clothes are a necessity. Human beings need clothes. We can't walk around. Well, we can walk around naked, but we get arrested. It's like, ah, so for me, that's got to be the headline, right? This is all the damage we're doing. And to talk you through how the damage occurs, it's either environmental damage or social damage. So brands are either damaging the environment in their production chains. So they're, for example, polluting too much in the wet process, which is the manufacturing of, of the product. So they are either leaking toxins into the water supply or into the air, or they're damaging the people that make these clothes by exploiting them, okay? If you have a business that tries at its heart not to damage the environment and not to exploit the people, then you can say you are trying to create a sustainable brand, a brand that has ethics and responsibility. You are not a sustainable brand because a fashion brand cannot be sustainable by definition. We cannot close the loop of a fashion brand. You know, once you sell a product, your product's out there and you don't know how that product life cycle is going to be brought to an end. Um, so unless you get it sent back to you and then you end the life cycle by reinvesting it into your new um, fabric, it will always be a close, it will always be an open loop. Yeah. So the simplest way to look at it is protect the environment, protect the people, and then you will have an ethical and responsible business that is aiming to be as sustainable as possible. The problem we have is big brands have got used to sustainability not being the normal. The normal is making the most amount of money possible by exploiting the resources at your disposal. And what are the resources at your disposal? The environment and the people. So you're making garments um, without factoring in the damage you are doing to the environment and the people which enables you to create a garment at a very low cost and it enables you to either then sell the garment at an extremely low cost in an extremely high frequency or you sell it at an extremely high cost at a very low frequency. So that's the, that's the luxury method versus the fast fashion method. Yep. So, it's, it, it's just, so, so are, are we making any headway as society? And, and, I, and I think for the sort of, to give as much value to the listener as possible, is there any way that they can shop more responsibly um, so as to not be a part of this problem? Because I think that's the really important thing. It's great to know about the issue, but what's even more valuable, I think, is to know how to, to be a part of the solution as opposed to a part of the problem. Yeah. Okay. So are we making headway? Yes. Kind of. <laughs> like, that's all I can say. Yes. Kind of. In the last five, six years, sustainability has been taught on the um on the educational uh sorry what's the word for sustainability has been taught at every university every fashion designer is having it taught as a as not as an option it is you know this is this is how we need to be going because the, the just look at the word sustainable the opposite of sustainable is unsustainable if it's unsustainable things come to an end yeah. it, this is not a joke if we keep going the way we're going, the world will implode. So, yeah, sustainability is now taught um, from an early age. So going forward, sustainability will become the norm. Every new business will, at the heart of it, be trying to be as sustainable as possible so it can enable itself to have the best opportunity as a commercial venture going forward as possible. I think the days of these giant um fast fashion brands that have no social and environmental conscience, um, being able to start a new and a fresh and exponentially grow, for example, Boohoo that happened recently, I think that will, might be the last one. I can't imagine that happening again, that people will just wash their hands of all the damage this brand is doing along its supply chain and say that it's okay to buy a six pound not even a six pound, a 60p dress. They were selling 60p dresses over Christmas. Um, and what is the cost of that 60p dress? You have to explore the supply chain to find that out. But it would be the damage against the environment and the people that make it. So I don't know. I just think there is progress being made. There's a lot more, more brands that are focusing on sustainability. And 
and making it their their main point of their manifesto. You know, the King and Tuckfield, the Nanushka, um, all these British, sorry, Nanushka excluded because that's from um, Hungary, but all these British brands that I work with, they are so focused on their craftsmanship and their heritage and their people, above all their people, that they're making all the right decisions. Um, they might never be as big as these blue chip organizations that make billions and billions and billions of pounds, but they're doing the right thing by the environment, their staff and the supply chain. Um, how can individuals make themselves better? As consumers, you are a right, you have a right to choose. You can go and shop wherever you want. And I would never criticize anyone from shopping anywhere because at the end of the day, it needs must. Like, if you earn a certain income, you can't necessarily. So, if you have a barrier to entry of a certain income, you can't shop sustainably because it's expensive to have a social conscience. Yeah. It's not free to have a social conscience. It's a luxury. This is another conversation that I always have with people. Being sustainable is a luxury. It's not an, something that everyone can do. Which is the issue, right? And I feel like. Yeah, I feel like that's what we always need to remember. So if you have to shop at a fast fashion retailer, please try to buy less. Buy better. So instead of buying 10 of everything, buy one of everything and look after it as well as you can. Um, or shop around and try and find an alternative at maybe a little bit more cost that will last you a little bit longer. There's always this notion now of price per wear. So if it's a fast fashion made, it's not made well. It will fall apart within 10 to 15 wears. Planned obsolescence is a part of their business structure. They don't want you wearing it forever. Whereas someone like Sunspell, they want you to buy a 60 pound t-shirt and wear a 60 pound t-shirt for five or six years. So you'll get a better price per wear out of the 60 pound than the six pound. But Again, explaining that to people is tough because that initial outlay is a barrier to entry. So if you are going to have to shop uh, fast fashion, I would say just please buy less. Please buy less man-made fabrics. So check the care label. Try not to buy polyester um, or any derivative of the plastic family. Try to buy uh, natural fibres, um, cottons, uh, wools linens, merinos, flax. Um, there's, there are man-made um, sustainable uh, options out there like uh, cellulose and, and some other stuff that are actually now really, really doing great things in the sustainable supply chain. So I don't know, just let's try not to buy plastic clothes. That's got to be the easiest yeah. thing. Check the care label. If it's plastic, don't buy it. But that's 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 a decision. I mean, that is... Um... It's I, I I'm guilty of it myself. You almost don't think about the fact that your clothes have plastic in them, I mean, and it's it's I'm sure it's it's so much more commonplace than um, than a lot of people realise. So uh, it's great. To, I think it's just be about being conscientious, right, and just trying to uh, to make the best decisions you can. And I guess if you can't afford to buy a luxury item that's going to last for better, then potentially looking at something like Depop or or Vinted or, or buying something secondhand would give you the opportunity yeah. to um, to buy a, a, a better made option and actually try and create that closed loop that you that you said um, is not sort of built into the fashion industry as much as we can do. Yeah, I mean, listen, if you can't shop sustainably because you have a barrier to entry, um, then the best thing to then do is look to extend the life cycle of a garment. You know, like you're saying, you, you, you shop secondhand or you then sell your clothes on. Your clothes shouldn't be going in the bin. Your clothes should always be going through from one hand to the next, to the next, to the next, because they're created with love and care and a high quality material. They should always be moving on and moving on and moving on. It's only this fast fashion revolution that we had in the nineties and noughties that had stopped that. I, you know, do you not remember like when you were growing up, it'd be like, Oh, these, these were your grandfathers or these were your dads. Yeah. Like it's, made with care yeah. even the t even the made t-shirts and the items that you wouldn't expect to be a, a long lasting piece i, I still have yeah. my that's my dad's old t-shirts knocking around looking great yeah. so a great example of that is 
look at the amount of band t-shirts from the 60s and 70s that are still in circulation now, compare that with the amount of band t-shirts from the noughties that are probably still in circulation, the numbers are nowhere near comparable. Band t-shirts back then were made out of cotton, 100% cotton. Now it's made out of God knows what. Yeah. Were the bands better then as well, though? That's the only issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Were, they, were they more ethical, responsible, and sustainable? Probably. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant, Rich. Well, I'm just going to finish now with um, with a question that I asked to all my guests, um, which is, yeah. what's the one small change that you've made in your life that you wish you'd made earlier on? Oh, I wish I got my teeth fixed earlier. <laughs> and not, I shit you not. Sorry, I don't know if I can swear. I shit you not. I didn't have really bad teeth, but. I had like a crooked smile, didn't I really? So I didn't smile. Um, that was just it. I just didn't smile. I didn't ever talk in a way that would allow my teeth to be shown or smile or anything, whether it's my personal life or my work. Um, but yeah, now it, 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 I don't know, it does, it, it brings an uh, extra layer of happiness to my life, knowing that if someone goes, oh, can you smile on camera? I can just smile or, you know, you can laugh about feeling self-conscious. It's kind of nice. Oh, that's that's, so that's I, awesome, mate. And I promise everyone I have not paid Rich to say that. <laughs> that was as much of a surprise for me as it was for you. <laughs> Wicked. Well, mate, thank you so much for uh, for coming on today. Um, there's there's actually so many more questions that I wanted to ask you, but I think we've probably run out of time today. We'll hopefully get you on again at some point in the future, hear about more of your um your collaborations and your your ventures that I'm sure you'll com- continue to uh, to succeed at. But thanks a lot for coming on today, and uh, yeah, we'll catch you next time. See you later. Yes, bye. Bye bye.